scheduled. Um, the first one is on that regulatory perimeter um, for digital currency in Australia, particularly navigating compliance and innovation in our local landscape. So we're going to be joined by our moderator today, Stephanie Basley, Investment Research Manager at Airtree. Uh, Shagri Poyaz, Global Head of Sanctions at Binance. Simon, now, Simon, I'm so sorry. Um, I Sappy Bits, Managing Director, Madison Branson Laws, and Michael Bettina. I should know that, but anyway, I always say it two different ways, just it depends on the audience. Um, he's the Blockchain Australia Chair and Partner at Piper Alderman, Jamie Lumsden, Partner at Hamilton Lock, Michael Mavromantis, Partner at Holly Nethercote, and Adam Percy, General Counsel at SwiftX. A nice, dynamic, uh, very well informed panel uh, today. Actually, it's a roundtable. I just have to let everyone know both of these roundtables, like every other session today, is being recorded. The difference between this day and every other day is that we will export all the key talking points, all of the, um, I guess, the, the leading topics of conversation, and that, that will be exported into a report that will give us a good view of how Australia is viewing that uh, global regulatory landscape. So without further ado, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, thank you, everyone, and welcome to our day four panel here at Blockchain Week Australia. We'll be defining the regulatory perimeter for digital currency here in Australia, um, essentially navigating compliance and innovation in this rapidly changing landscape. Um, so thank you so much for joining the panel on compliance. Um, I'd like to go through and have a little bit of a chat, um, introduce uh, who, who we have on our panel today. So first up, we have uh, Chagri Poyaz, who is from Binance in Abu Dhabi. We have Adam Percy, who is from SwiftX uh, up in Gold Coast in Queensland. We have uh, Simon Sarpepes, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, <laughs> from Madison Brands and Lawyers in Melbourne. Uh, Michael Pacina from Piper Alderman in Sydney. And again, he is the chair of the board of the directors of Blockchain Australia. We have Michael Mavromatis from Holly Nethercote in Sydney, and we have Jamie Lumsden from Hamilton Lock in Sydney also. Um, so I, I think this may be a fairly topical panel um, with a fair bit of regulatory uncertainty and escalating tensions between industry and regulators on what exactly is the best way forward for the lawful use of crypto and decentralized technology. This is already a massive industry and it's growing fast with the global blockchain technology market size projected to grow from about 17.68 billion at the moment in 2023, all the way to essentially 470 billion or so in 2030. Um, and certainly we can see that other countries are jumping in feet first and some are taking a back seat. Um, so here in Australia, just two days ago, we saw Austrac release new guidance on debanking um, in response to a bit of industry outcry to the restriction of crypto assets. Um, so I'd love to kind of lead us into this question based on kind of a legal definition of a crypto asset. What exactly is a financial product <laughs> um, and what does that look like in decentralized technology? And should we be keeping that definition or should we redefine it with these changing times in technology? I'd love to hear from um, maybe Jamie to start us off. Yeah, look, sure. Um, so at the moment, we have a definition of financial product, which appears in Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act. Um, what we have seen to date is difficulties applying some of those definitions to digital assets. Um, you can apply it, but the way in which a lot of digital assets are structured it's new, it's innovative, it's novel. Um, it is not in any way what was contemplated um, by the drafters of the legislation. You can apply it in some cases and it's relatively straightforward. Then there are other cases where it's hard to sort of know whether it fits into the definition because of some of the technological um, implications of the blockchain and the way that things work. In particular, decentralization is a really big one. So a lot of our definitions are based around the idea of a person doing a thing so as soon as you introduce decentralization, there's no person to do whatever the thing is that's defined, um, and it will tend to fail the definition of financial products. Um, so there's definitely some problems around current definitions failing to be suit suitable for purpose um, where you've got decentralization. And then there's what I would probably call some fringe cases uh, where it looks like a financial product, um, 
but there's sort of different ways to structure it on the blockchain, which might mean that you can either choose to sort of opt in or opt out of regulation. And while that's not necessarily a fault of the definitions, it's not very good from regulatory intention sort of perspective in the sense that you get disparity in the way that things are regulated. Um, so the answer to the question, should we change the definition? It's kind of yes and no. <laughs> um, some of the definitions that we have right now are just fine. Um, and we should continue to regulate the things that we have regulated in the past because there were good regulatory intentions behind regulating those things and consumer protection purposes. Um, but we also need to change some of those definitions because the way that the blockchain has evolved to produce digital assets means that some of the things that we originally intended to regulate in order to protect consumers are no longer being regulated. And so now that we sort of know what the blockchain is and wasn't in the contemplation of original drafters, we need to think about how should we draft this legislation with the intent in mind to achieve the outcome given the fact that we now have um, new models like decentralization and things like that. That's a great answer. So maybe somewhere in the middle. <laughs> um, would you agree with that? Um, I'd love to pass over to Michael Mavramatis. Would you agree with Jamie's um, thoughts on that point? Stephanie, yes, I do agree with all of that. Um, what I would add is there's also a lot of flow on effects uh, apart from, so you might think, what is a financial product? as we've just discussed, but the flow on is what happens with financial products, what financial services are relevant here. So if you suddenly have a financial product, which um, wasn't a financial product before, and you're operating uh, an exchange, does that suddenly mean that you're operating a financial market, which is probably something that people would like to avoid in future? Or um, another example is, am I suddenly making a market because the sort of products I'm dealing with are, are now financial products, is that what was initially intended? And yeah, I would suggest no. Wonderful. So I suppose that leads us into what debanking is in general. Um, and so I'd love to maybe pass across to Michael Bacina, um, or Bacina, I think it's Bacina, <laughs> um, and um, have a little bit of a discussion. Michael, what is debanking and should we care about it? And why does it matter? Thanks so much, Stephanie. And thanks everyone for being here and for um, the excellent number of people who have tuned in to watch today as well. Um, look, debanking has a, has a long running history conversation in the digital asset space. Uh, and we've seen some issues pop up around that. It's, a, it's, a, it's considered a little bit different from some of the payment restrictions issues that we've seen in recent weeks. Um, but it's definitely a, a hot area for the industry. Debanking is where a bank, which is a commercial enterprise, decides that it doesn't wish to do business with uh, one of its customers. Um, and it, depending on how you're defining debanking, some you know in the industry it would be called de-risking. Uh, some people would treat it as an inability to obtain a bank account, or if they have existing banking services, uh, having the, their account, notification of accounts being closed. Um, there's a, a fair bit of mystery around it because there are rules around um, anti-tipping off if there's AML CTF, that is anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing concerns on the part of the bank, which prevent a bank from telling someone if they're closing an account, for example, because they think there's a um, money laundering risk associated with it. Um, that, of course, leads to a position where banks tend not to give much information when they're closing accounts full stop and leads to um, a gap of understanding where businesses might say, well, what can we do to ensure we're meeting the appropriate standards to have banking? And if it fits into the context of um, banking more broadly and our movement towards a greater uh, digitized economy where 20 years ago, it was quite common for people to go down and pay for things with cash. But we've seen from recent um, figures, I think released from the RBA and other surveys that the use of cash has been, just been falling off a cliff um, and really reducing uh, debit cards and credit cards remain quite quite high in use, which means that um, over these last sort of couple of decades, banking has, the banking services and, pa and digital payment rails have become increasingly important as more and more of our day-to-day -day transactions occur on the internet. And that means that a situation where a business finds itself where it doesn't have access to those rails um, is, uh, it's a little bit more than what the government stated in a policy response yesterday saying it could lead people to return to cash. They simply can't operate in a cash environment because customers aren't carrying cash and they don't want to transact in cash. So it leads to a situation where businesses are simply at risk of being shut down or going into insolvency. Uh, so it's a very complicated problem with lots of different um, parts to be unpacked. And I think we had really good outcome from a blockchain Australia roundtable on scams. Scams are a really serious issue with numbers being tossed around that have to be unpacked properly and the data understood so it can be measured 
correctly, but um, it's quite clear that you know, there, there's a link of scams and fraudulent behavior that goes into banks' decisions whether or not to continue banking services to certain entities. Uh, and that's something that is, that is a, a point where meaningful progress can be made by many in, I think, the digital asset industry. The way that digital assets have, have grown up, to Jamie's point, is not in the same way that traditional financial services have grown up or other industries have grown up because there are, there are ways that digital assets operate that are completely new and novel. And that creates really new and novel challenges. So I really, I would applaud the banks for, for their, their investment in their lab teams that have been getting across the technology and understanding it, because education is always the first step, followed by data. And we've seen the government endorse um, the data sharing recommendation out of the um, Council of Financial Service Regulators um, to understand more about the debanking problem. Because I don't think even the government has had access to really good data about what it, to what extent debanking impacts businesses, whether it's within the blockchain industry or otherwise. Absolutely. I love what you said about um, new and novel development leading to new and novel challenges. And I think that really lends itself to the idea that as we're developing, we should be coming up with our own solutions to problems as well. So we'll talk about that in a little second as well. Simon, how did you feel about this idea of debanking? And, um, you know, do you agree with Michael's take on that? I do. Michael always provides a, a very succinct and, and thoughtful response. Um, it's hard in, this, in these instances not to criticise the banks. A lot of it depends, as Michael says, which side of the fence that you sit on. If you're looking from the bank's perspective, obviously there's going to be a different perspective. Um, but for, per, for personal, um, for individuals and businesses, we are at their mercy. Um, and so the, the difficulty with that is um, it, there is a hindrance to innovation and, and businesses undertaking, particularly new ones. Um, and so it can be particularly destructive for um, new and emerging enterprises to have access to, to banking and to be able to further their businesses. Um, but the issue is not specific to Australia. It's, it's um, an issue abroad, you know, particularly in Singapore as well. Um, and you know, the immediate, immediate concern is that the lack of transparency is difficult to, is difficult to make, meet the bank's threshold in order to you know, overcome uh, the reasons for why they may not provide the banking services in the first place. So, um, because it's not specific to Australia, I mean, that encourages us to, to talk about maybe harmonising laws and to inviting other jurisdictions to be able to um, have a more of a, 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 a streamlined approach when it comes to that so that we can increase relations between different jurisdictions and enhance innovation and business. Absolutely. So to, sp to throw a bit of a spanner into the work, Simon, I'm going to ask you, do you think um, some people have actually brought up in Senate hearings back in September 21, I think, um, that potentially uh, debanking and uh, an increased uh, compliance uh, demand from banks is actually a little anti-competitive, um, particularly even uh, transfer wise, which is now regarded as wise based out of London, um, had had mentioned that of Australian banks. What's your opinion on that on that take? Possibly, it's hard to say, and I think that's the, the reason why we. Um, it, it's hard to say because there has been a lack of information and data. Um, it's possible, you know. It's um, the Commonwealth Bank, for example, had an initiative in, um, early that it uh, decided not to pursue for the time being. Um, is it possible that it may decide to venture into that space and, and compete in its own right? Possibly, um, but. On the other side of the coin, it creates opportunities for banks like neo banks like Wise to, to, to you know, increase onboarding as well. Um, as we're seeing, quite a few clients turn to them where they can't get access to traditional banking services. Amazing. So, getting kind of back onto that response from uh, from Austrac itself. Do we think that this is a positive response? Um, perhaps we can have a little bit of a brief discussion on what they've mentioned. Um, so positive, both in terms of fintech and digital assets. Um, perhaps we'll um, head back to you, Michael Gacina. Well, I don't want to take up all the space. I, I'm keen. I'm keen to hear. Can we, can we throw to Adam? If, of course. Uh, if yeah. Let, let's do that. Exchange, <laughs> exchange perspective. They're at the coalface on this. Sure. Sure. And thanks, Stephanie, and everyone at Blockchain Australia. It's, it's really great to be here today. Um, I'm coming to you from SwiftX's Brisbane office. Uh, I keep I keep, uh, I keep keep lobbying for a Gold Coast office because that's where I live, but uh, not there yet, maybe in the next bull run. Um, look, I, you know, banking is a, it, it's such a vexed issue, right, for all of the reasons that the, that the panelists have just, have just gone through. 
I think, you know, it, it's helpful, certainly, uh, to hear Austrac uh, guidance come out. Um, and I think we're starting to see more jurisdictions uh, start to uh, start to do this a little bit more. Certainly, Hong Kong is the one that uh, stands out the most to me at the moment. Uh, I mean, they are making a really considered push to get their major banks to positively bank crypto businesses. Um, I mean, obviously, I work at a, at a crypto brokerage platform, so you know, we would love to see more things like that in more places of the world. Um, but you know, look, we're realistic. We're we're on a journey with this. Um, I think the key here is just continued collaborative discussions among all the relevant stakeholders. And I'm optimistic that the forthcoming uh, regulatory regime for crypto asset providers such as SwiftX um, is going to provide that clarity and certainty that, you know, the responsible players in the industry are properly licensed and they're worth getting banking services. Amazing. So kind of on that point of international collaboration and how everybody is dealing with this a little bit differently in their own nation states, um, if we zoom out a little bit and we look at um, how Australia has been fairly collaborative in its response, um, I know, for example, they're expect, um, accepting perspectives in terms of token mapping, um, AML, CTF and payments reform um, with some high profile international moves of late from the SEC over in the US. A lot of people are left wondering what Australia's response is going to be. Um, I'd love to hear uh, from Shagri at Binance. Um, do you have any perspectives on this matter? I'm sorry, you may be on mute. <laughs> Apologies for that. One sec. It would not let me unmute. Oh, we can hear you now. Okay, so, sorry about that. Uh, sorry for that technical difficulty there. So yes, the SEC finally uh, showed took actions, and 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 but there is still a gray area. So there is still a gray, gray area between even the U.S. regulators right now to 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 define what crypto is. Is crypto a security or is it a commodity? So there is that debate going on. Even you, if you want to look from a, from a broader perspective, global perspective, what MICA define in Europe is probably more solid than what US is right now. So if you want to connect that to Australia, because uh, then Australia being obviously a major player, but always tends to see what US likes, US does first, and clarity in US doesn't really help to countries like Australia or my home country, Canada, very similar situation. So there is, it, it is a tough subject, but there is an ongoing um, struggle, I would say, to, to, to have a, a global standard, to define a global standard, not only on the uh, legislation part of it, or not only on the standards or guidances part of it, but even the definitions. I mean, if you cannot have the definitions, you cannot build legislation, you cannot issue guidances. So there is that, I'm not going to call it, I wanna be very careful in my words there, I'm not going to call it a deadlock, but there is uncertain, uncertainty right now that, that what we have. But on the other hand, if you again, look from a global perspective, like, like my colleague Adam just rightly said, what Hong Kong recently did with, with, with uh, especially on the banking channels or, or encouraging their major banks, one of them is uh, HSBC there is, is, is interesting because what, what is going on is probably the frustration that some major players again, I mean, Hong Kong is a major player, Singapore is another major player, Abu Dhabi where my office is, 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 is a, I mean, you know, uh, is, a, is a major player. So you can see that uh, moves, are being, moves are being already uh, implemented, I would say, and, uh, and that, that also creates another level of pressure with major powers like US. Um, so I wish I could, I could give you a more clear answer, but this is a very, very tough uh, topic, I would say, like it's especially in, when it comes from a global perspective. But the short answer to you will be, there is no global global standard. There is no global standard. There is no unity. Without a global standard or a unity, obviously we will be just we we will continue to be in this gray area for a while. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a bit of a difficult time to be either a broker or a centralized exchange. Um, maybe we could pass back to Adam just for a moment. 
in all of this regulatory uncertainty, I'm guessing that you have to have a little bit of um, forward thinking and uh, you have to take it, take advantage of um, what you know um, as your um, as, as your industry perspective um, without any guidance um, or limited guidance from, from uh, regulators. So what are you doing at SwiftX um, to supplement that? Sure. Uh, look, I mean, continuing with my earlier comment of, you know, everyone's on a journey with everything really in crypto. Um, I joined SwiftX in October of 2021, which was in the, the heat of the last bull market. Uh, you know, and at that time, uh, there was sort of a flurry of, of these new players that had emerged onto the market. Um, so just for, for context, for in case the audience doesn't know, so um, SwiftX uh, was formed as a broker. And what that means essentially is that we facilitate access to a number of different crypto tokens across a range of global liquidity providers. Um, and that was really in response to the demand that our founders, Alex and Angus, were seeing in the market for Australians. It was, you know, you could trade in a few coins through local uh, liquidity pools, but you really couldn't get access to great pricing or indeed a greater number of tokens unless you went sort of away from Australia. So the Australian brokers, the Australian broker model was uh, spun up to provide that access. And so effectively, you're dealing with a trusted onshore Australian entity with a you know, a Brisbane based customer support team, um, you know, and, and so these were businesses that were really built in response to just market developments and demands. Um, having said that, of course, because for all the reasons that, you know, Jamie and Michael and Michael and Simon and, you know, everyone has, has, uh, um, uh, has described, you know, these are businesses that weren't built uh, requiring something like a financial services license from day one, uh, as opposed to say like a share trading brokerage, which, you know, in order to operate, you'd have to obtain your license. You know, so we're we're sort of you know in a little bit in a little ways it was sort of like kind of cart before the horse, you know, and we see this playing out in other jurisdictions as well. Obviously, uh, Coinbase and uh, the rest are having um, their arguments over in the United States about that. Um, but you know, I guess we took the view at SwiftX that you know obviously regulation's coming, and I think you know the longer the process you know has has, has gone here from token mapping, now we've got consultation and uh, sorry uh, custody and licensing consultation that's coming out in a few weeks. You know, our view is that we we pretty we think we pretty well know where this is going to end up. You know, we think that, you know, as, as the Treasury uh, person, Mr. Power said on day one, you know, they're looking at the conventional regulatory frameworks and working within those frameworks. Uh, so, you know, we've long said that we think the AFSL regime is a robust one and it's capable of accommodating uh, crypto assets. And so we, you know, being relatively firm in that view, we just took the took the step to say, well, we're just going to start building right now. You know, if we think we're going to end up there or somewhere like that, then there's a lot of work that we can do right now. We don't have to have every single rule fleshed out. I think both understanding the local regime for the TradFi businesses and seeing developments in uh, jurisdictions like the EU and then uh, international bodies such as IOSCO, I think there is plenty of material out there for businesses in our position to be just starting our uplift right now so that by the time the rules are clarified, we're ready to go. We don't have to sit around and go, oh, no, now we have to do this you know, major program of work. And so that's what we've been doing. You know, we're in a bear market and people say that in bear markets, it's a time to build. We're building, that's what we're doing. Amazing answer. Uh, Sorry, Michael. I'm gonna just jump, just jump in there because you know, fundamentally, I think to Adam's point, there's three outcomes of where Australian regulation will end up for certainly centralized exchanges. We will have something with, you know, to Adam's prediction uh, um, uh, for the category or authorizations under AFSL. So that would be best case an AFSL regime with properly tailored rules and, and guidance for the unique aspects of digital assets. Or number two, uh, a bespoke regime or something which looks a bit AFSL light, um, which it, again, has to be tailored to the unique characteristics of digital assets. Or the third and worst outcome, nothing at all, where things just continue along um, as they are, which doesn't seem to be, you know, the industry doesn't really want that. You've heard from exchanges. Um, I think Caroline Bell is always very vocal. I remember last year, and blockchain week a big call out of please regulate me um so you know rarely has there been an industry which has been looking for regulation um but trying to help make sure it goes in the right way because i think to chagri's point when you have disparate international um frameworks coming out uh and other licensing dropping in different jurisdictions it's one of the most mobile industries and australia is very lucky to be punching above its weight to date but we're still seeing, as as it was mentioned in previous blockchain weeks, and mentioned again as I did my opening um, welcome this year, continued brain drain. We continue to see people moving to jurisdictions where there is certainty 
doesn't mean there's less protections in those jurisdictions or they're trying to go somewhere where it's really easy to do something dodgy. It's just about there being actual certainty and certainty around regulation. Regulation, as a word, comes from regular. It's about making things the same. Um, where there's some certainty as to what needs to be done, provides certainty to, around things like debanking and treatment under law, treatment of contracts. And I think that's um, that's what a lot of people want. The real danger, of course, is whether or not the devil in the details or how it comes through, getting to what Jamie, Jamie mentioned earlier about whether um, if something is simply swept up as a financial product, there's certain ways that they just simply can't comply. And there's a reason why you don't have any digital currency exchange in Australia registered as a market or registered with AFSLs at the moment because crypto assets have not been treated broadly by ASIC as financial products. Um, and if they turned around and said they were tomorrow, ASIC would likely have pressure to provide some grandfathering arrangements to move it on through. So there's really important policy decisions that probably should happen at parliament level to, to decide where Australia wants to go. And there's been really amazing work being done at Treasury. You know, big, big um, congratulations to the government for providing that necessary funding for Treasury to carry that work forwards and do that consultation so the licensing can, can come through. And we have this amazing opportunity. The UK Law Reform Commission just dropped another fantastic paper, uh, I believe it was yesterday, on digital asset um, regulation approaches. And they've really dug into that definitional issues. And their recommendation is, is really neat in that they think digital assets should broadly be a third type of property uh, because we obviously have um, shows us in possession, like a car or something you can hold, shows us, and shows in action, which is like a debt or some kind of contractual claim. And they've been the broad two categories of property. So um, for the UK to be saying it's time to legislate in a third category of property really recognises a lot of these tokens and digital assets are something brand new. And, and that's a really important principled definition. A lot of people get caught up in that US commodity securities distinction. We don't really have that in Australia. And when you get into the nuance, really in America, security can just be a commodity that has security features to it. So it's not really this bright line binary division that some people will talk about um, if, they, if they're you know, early in their journey of digging into the wonders and excitement of US law. But I, I certainly prefer the, and have always preferred that UK approach of really leaning into our common law history and saying, let's, let's define it within the thousand years we have of common law history that's worked really, really well because it can accommodate these things. And then the, that tailoring can help things flow from there because the property issue is, is quite important to where the regulatory perimeter lands. You don't want to accidentally have a situation where you're, you know, a business like an eBay is suddenly required to have a financial market um, license and meet all kinds of regulations that simply aren't needed to, to address the risks which aren't posed by a platform like eBay. Um, but nor do you want something that's operating looking an awful lot like a stock market to be running, running around doing those things and, and for, um, exposing people to risks in the same way that they would be faced but for regulation of the actual stock markets in this country. Yeah, just to add to Michael on that, and I agree on all those points, is it's also important to, to help the regulators because regulators, they, they, their lenses are traditional financial institutions. Most of the questionnaires even, I mean, I even seen the recent, recent questionnaires from, from your regulators in Australia, like when you look into them, they are, they are not crypto, uh, they, are not, they are not tuned for crypto or for digital assets in general, really. So you do, have, you do need to help them to understand also the, 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 the industry, the technology and all that. So I think that there is a huge role for us as, as global exchanges there too. So the dialogue has to be open. We should be, we should be partners on, on, on that. So to help them to do that switch. And that's exactly what the UK Law Reform Commission has said. So they said common law development is fine for now. It works. Their two approaches that they suggest is both targeted statutory law reform, which I think is what Australia is doing at present, but also the industry guidance, which I think to Chagri's point about um, arrangement, it's, it's said by the UK Law Reform Commission is making arrangements for the provision of further guidance from industry experts to support common law and statutory development, which is really, which I think is really important. Actually, also to Chagri's point, I think this idea um, that you've got international regulators producing all sorts of uh, proposals for reform. You've got IOSCO um, and their recent paper, which I have to say, I thought it was a really useful reference point. I read the paper. I thought this is really well written. I understand all of this. This is amazing. I, I didn't have to go off and do any research. Now, the truth is um, I'm very involved in crypto assets, as is our firm, but 
I've been a tradfi lawyer for about two decades. And so when I read that paper, I do think to myself, what we're going to do in Australia and other countries is far more nuanced than just taking traditional financial services and then looking at your, um, you know, same activity, same risk, same regulation type approach. So that's uh, certainly not a phrase that I've coined. But if you think about it that way and what the FSB has put forward as their attitude to regulation, I'd certainly like to see something more like, uh, uh, you know, similar activity, similar risk, specialised regulation, which is really important here for all of the reasons uh, that we've discussed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, another way of looking at this is actually using the technologies, um, these emerging technologies to supplement and support these efforts. And I know over at Binance, you've been using technology to help you with the, with these efforts, Shagri? Yeah, so we are, naturally, we are one of the, one of the, the, the biggest contributor to those, those technologies too. So we do use the industry standards like chain analysis, TRM, elliptic, those are all the tools that we use, but we also develop our in-house tools just to supplement that. And we also assist those, 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 or those companies to, to even enhance their tool further. Because at the end of the day, being the global exchange, being the biggest exchange, we do have more data. We have more. I mean, obviously, we have more KYC than any any other exchange has. So we we do we do help them to 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 tune their tools uh, because we believe that if you can actually make compliance more accessible in digital assets, that will help the industry to grow. Uh, so that that building that culture around compliance is very important. Uh, finance, traditional financial institutions, they did that. Uh, it's easier for them to do it, but in a, obviously in a, in a, in a blockchain, uh, there are advantages and disadvantages like we all know. So we all have to work uh, together to find a way to make it more accessible. And also while doing it though, and uh, that's, I mean, that's a very important point, we should also acknowledge the fact that we are still waiting for regulation in most jurisdictions and none of those tools, because those are commercial products, are an industry standard. So like we have to find a way to also get those tools, those technologies developed in such a way that, that uh, there are common repositories, for example, like that, that, is, that is one idea we have. We try to, so in, a, in another way that we try to, uh, we use these companies, but we also try to encourage them to have a, a standard together. So I think that's very important too. Absolutely. And I suppose um, we're kind of coming to the last 10 minutes or so. Um, I'd love to go around to each of our, um, our panelists here today and just have a little bit of a wrap up, um, you know, um, you can kind of uh, say whatever you'd like, but I was thinking it might be a really good idea um, just to say, what do you think is the greatest and highest priority right now for our regulators and industry? Um, or what, you, what do you think our community should be doing um, to create that ideal environment of balanced growth and consumer safety? So um, perhaps we can start with you, Jamie. That's a really big question. Um, <laughs> uh, look, I think... Um, Michael sort of alluded to it before when he sort of said the third option is that we wind up with no regulation and that would be a terrible outcome. Um, so to some degree at this point in time, I do think that coming up with some form of regulatory regime, ideally one that works really well, <laughs> um, is definitely going to be a high priority because we're kind of at the point where we're starting to see um, uncertainty from lack of regulation. We've got problems across multiple jurisdictions. We're seeing regulators starting to take action against cryptocurrency businesses. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty around what they're going to take action for um, and, and what they're not. Um, even in this country, um, we've sort of seen ASIC sort of start to take um, action against people like Block Earner and Finder Earn. Um, at the same time, um, there will be lawyers around the country who are working with clients who are playing in spaces that might be similar um, or might be similar-ish, but there's something that distinguishes it from those 
cases, but it's really hard to actually give advice to clients right now about what the risks are to them. You know, are you in a bucket with block owner? Um, are you sufficiently different? Um, why is ASIC taking action against the people that it's taking action against, but not other people who sort of also seem to be playing in spaces that are not appropriately regulated in ways that the regulator should see are risky. And that's starting to create a lot of uncertainty um, for my clients and I'm sure other participants in the crypto industry. The other thing I'm starting to see is increased action overseas, um, putting the spotlight on tokens and services here in Australia that previously have perhaps um, not been controversial, not been an issue. Um, and now lawyers are starting to look at tokens that previously were not contentious and actually start to go, wait, hang on a second. If we apply our regulatory regime to this particular platform and this particular service or token, is it a financial product? Maybe it is a sign, like perhaps it might be. Um, so that also is increasing regulatory uncertainty, I think. And I know of a few people in the industry who are starting to look at things like that and have a bit more of a conservative risk attitude. So I do think that some form of regulatory regime right now is got to be our highest priority, but we have to do it right. Because if we don't do it right, then of course it is not going to fix the problem. It will create more problems and it will make the whole situation worse. Um, and we'll lose the sector and we'll lose participants because they won't be able to comply because the compliance burden is too high or because we impose um, requirements that these businesses literally can't comply with in the context of decentralization, the blockchain. Uh, so I do think that that has to be our focus right now. Absolutely. It would be a massive loss, I think, to Australia to, um, to force people out. Um, Simon, how about we go to you? Do you have a wish list or a, a priority list for, for this topic? I, I do, but we'll be here till the cows come home, um, unfortunately. Um, look, I, I think that education is, is one of the components that I, I'd look to. Regulation, definitely. We need some parameters that tell us um, you know, what things are and how we can behave. Um, you know, I've thought about whether it's important to maybe educate consumers a little bit more, get them a bit more informed, arm them to make um, better decisions, I mean, certainly with the risk of all the scams. Um, and I've considered maybe some sort of form of sandbox testing it needs more involvement through by government and the regulators. And, you know, Binance is a, is a prime candidate for doing it, particularly in, in working in different jurisdictions. And, um, and, I, and I think that's probably possible um, you know, assuming Binance wants to do that, but you, you consider IOSCO's recommendations dealing with um, uh, vertically integrated products um, and dealing with the conflicts there. I think there's there are ways to take that that harmonious approach and um, apply that to a sandbox testing by using leaders that have great reach over over the over the world, such as Binance. That's a great point, um, Chagri. Perhaps we'll uh, shoot across to you. Just, uh, I think that's a very good point by Simon. So I'm a global function in Binance. Binance is a global exchange. We do have our local team in Australia, in New Zealand, so in that region, but me being here on Australian event shows the commitment there too. So we are definitely, we will be here. The reason we'll be here is because I think, I think we passed, we already passed the point that that the that the crypto is not going to disappear right so australia might lose the market but the crypto market will be there australians will be still using crypto you will not be able to stop australians to use crypto china tried to do that a couple of years ago see what happened right now so so from going from that angle binance will always be there for 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 the users for the customers and uh, so no matter what challenges we'll have uh dialogue is very important i think if, if there is a wish list there that is the dialogue it's a dialogue in every level uh and we are fully committed for that finance will be here that's a that's a great line <laughs> um how about you adam i'll go off me i'm gonna i guess i'm gonna kind of pick up on the education team and i might echo um previous comments by michael a, a while earlier talking about how the, the need to adapt the regulations to fit the specifics of crypto and how it actually works. I think the key right now for uh, policymakers, for government, for everyone who has a has a stake in the regulatory outcomes for this industry in Australia, is just to educate yourself about the Australian ecosystem and the the nuanced business models that exist. Um, and one reason I'm optimistic that um, we have a government and policymakers that are uh, that are going to do this is because they've already done it with the buy now pay later sector. Um, that's our most recent 
sort of fintech regulatory update uh, in Australia um, uh, prior to what we're doing now with crypto. And what you saw there is a, is a real recognition of, you know, here is your updated regulatory regime, but we acknowledge that, you know, there are certain business models that are going on here. And so we're not going to just drop the existing law on you without appropriate tailoring to make sure that we preserve this thriving industry. I think we need to do the same thing uh, with the crypto industry here. And I think we can do that. But the key is education and engagement. Amazing. Uh, Michael, Michael Mavramatis, perhaps, and then we'll finish Stephanie, with that. Yes, thanks. So, uh, look, obviously, regulation is needed. One of those reasons is, is investor confidence. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing the uh, proposals from the government in relation to custody. That is a huge issue. Um, I'm also hopeful in terms of those reforms. Uh, I think what we'd be looking for is, um, if you look at IOSCO, IOSCO, for example, they uh, do acknowledge that assets may be held overseas. That hasn't always been the view. So, um, uh, from a you know tradfi perspective, uh, I think I don't think that's too far removed from what happens at the moment. Just think about a regular custodian who might hold global equities in another jurisdiction using a sub custodian. Those securities are held in a different jurisdiction. Why should crypto be any uh, different? But of course, it's a matter of going through all of those sort of nuanced arguments uh, and working out what the real risks here are. But yeah, really looking forward to hearing more about custody. Great, great point. Uh, and Michael, how about you? Thanks so much, Stephanie. And uh, I think I'm very lucky to be last because everyone's made such fantastic points, which, which I definitely endorse. I think that... Um, the two main, you know, if it was my, my priority wish lists would be to have the licensing and custody for exchanges and, and centralized exchanges in particular move forward as quickly as possible. I think that would give great certainty to, to the industry. Um, and I think that Australia has a really valuable opportunity. We were, we were considered leaders five years ago when we brought in the AML CTF laws that recognized it and put a registration regime for DCAs. But we have, as Jane recognized on day one, definitely slipped towards the rear guard of what's happening in the regulatory march onwards. And I, I personally believe that the UK approach plus perhaps some, some parts of MICA are really valuable close to our existing regime. Um, and we can learn also from the American model and what's happening there with the everything's fine, you can go in and change your business model so it's no longer decentralized and registered, no problems, um, which, which is, appears to be unfortunately the position there uh, to see what's happening as a, as a live test of what happens if you get it wrong. Um, so I'm really hopeful that we will have our policymakers and regulators look to the EU, EU and UK markets to say, what's already been done? What, whose shoulders can we stand on to get higher? Um, what, perhaps Australia wants to be closer to the Singapore, Hong Kong or Dubai models. But I have a feeling, given our shared history and longstanding common law tradition with the UK, that it'll be more comfortable for regulators and policymakers to, to look at that shared history. Um, so I certainly think... You know, and one immediate point out of this is I will be sending under Blockchain Australia letterhead personally signed copies of the UK Law Reform Commission reports to the relevant policymakers and politicians who need to have them because there's so much great material coming out all the time talking about regulation. There's also um, a challenge in Treasury and our politicians just keeping up with it and, and staying across it. I think I know many of the lawyers here and other lawyers also speak to the difficulties of staying on top of, um, of just the raw amount of material coming out and saying, well, every day we've got this tremendous further material coming out. And five years ago, we were sort of begging for some of it. And now we've got this flood of it. And it's great if we don't need sleep, but uh, we, you know, it, it all builds on that knowledge. And that does at least you know, tie over to the information sharing and, and, and transparency. I will note, just to, just to close out one of your earlier questions, that Austrac guidance that came out endorsed the information sharing aspects we touched on at the start of this round table. And so I also hope that we'll see a, a real collaboration between traditional banking and traditional finance and crypto asset and blockchain businesses to share data so that we can all get to the same outcome, that, which is what we want in terms of creating safe environments for users and those who are investing to undertake those functions, knowing that they're only going to face the risks that they're well aware of. There's enough volatility in there as, as it is without introducing other risks that can cause losses. And that's, that's a fundamental you know, shared goal that I think we can all agree on and then work towards. Absolutely. I think that seems like a um, a very reasonable um, path forward, both for TradFi and for crypto. Um, but I'll be, I, I think some people will be watching out for some mail from Mich uh, from Michael Vecina now after you've said that. <laughs> um, so, I mean, thank you to everyone for uh, joining today, um, our roundtable. Um, 
really some great discussion. Hopefully these conversations will continue to happen between industry regula regulators and lawmakers. Um, I think the ideal situation is one where we aren't alienating either side of the debate, fostering in innovation, but also using these technologies to their full extent um, in ways that support and supplement safe growth of the blockchain industry. I, for one, feel super, super lucky to be part of these conversations in a country like Australia. The perfect landscape to attract talent and industry with forward thinking and clear regulation. And I'm really optimistic for open communication between industri industry and regulators looking forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, and your enthusiasm, Stephanie, is contagious and, and felt throughout the whole industry, I think. So thank you so much to our regulatory roundtable number one. We are now going to have a pretty deep conversation about tax. So I am going to